This is Ham College, episode 100, for April 28, 2023. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Explore the world of microwave with ICOM's new SHF Portable, the IC905. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we have some questions for you tonight. Well, but we don't have any answers. No, we got Yeah, us. we will. But, yeah, we're working on them. I just don't know what they are right now. No, you'll, you'll get some of these. Or not. It's um, You have a 25% chance of getting them all right. I got a twenty five percent chance of getting at least one right. right. <laughs> what did we talk about last month? Do you recall? I do recall. Uh I remember we talked about active filters and op amp circuits, maybe a little active audio filters, characteristics, basic circuit design and, and uh seem to recall something about operational amplifiers in there too. Well this month one of your favorite topics here. Oscillators and signal sources, types of oscillators, synthesizers and phase-like loops, direct digital synthesizers, stabilizing thermal drift, microphonics, and high-accuracy oscillators. Hmm. So it sounds like an interesting topic. I think you answered the first one last time. Okay. I'll I'll take the first one here. Okay. Seems like it might be a setup, but we'll see. It, it's no, well. Are you on it? No. I don't want any of them. You can answer all of them. <laughs> what are the what are three oscillator circuits used in amateur radio equipment? A. Taft, Pierce, and negative feedback. B. Pierce, Fenner, and Bean. Is that what that says? That's how I'm reading it. Or C. Taft, Hartley, and Pierce. Or D, Cole Pitts, Hartley, and Pierce. C, that was one of the presidents, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, let's start at the top. Uh, A, Taft, Pierce, and negative feedback. Well, I just happen to know that oscillators generally work with positive feedback. So I don't think it's A. Uh, I also don't remember a Taft oscillator. Uh, B, Pierce, Fenner, and Bean? Bean? B-E-A-N-E? Yeah. I've never heard of a Fenner or Bean oscillator, so I don't think it's that. C, Taft, Hartley, and Pierce. Well, I've heard of Hartley and I've heard of Pierce, but I haven't heard of Taft. D, Cole, Pitts, Hartley, and Pierce. That's going to be my answer. It, what would you have thought here i don't know i I've, I've seen that coal pits before mm-hmm. but i only i might have picked out only because that name is that's familiar but i don't really know what the difference between them are okay let's see the chat room is saying d that was my thought they are Kevin's seen five Ds. And there it is. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and give you that. Okay. Maybe I, I'm going to give away a bunch of stuff if I do some splaining right here. But it's down on the paper that, see the yellow place here? That means I, I need it's to It's time do, for some splaining. It's time for some splaining. Well, it won't be none too soon, I can tell you. <laughs> okay. I know one guy's going to be paying pretty close attention. There is a Hartley oscillator on the left-hand side and a coal pits on the right. Now, these are simplified schematics. Look at the emitter on the transistor there. On the Hartley, that feedback is going between two coils. Uh-huh. 
Over on the coal pits, it's going between a voltage divider made out of two capacitors. So it's the same thing, you know, basically uh, you put a coil and capacitor in parallel like that. You got a tank circuit and it's resonant at a specific frequency. It's just one of them's doing it on the inductor side of that and the other's doing it on the capacitor side. The heart oscillator is an oscillator circuit in which the oscillation frequency is determined by a tuned circuit consisting of capacitors and inductors. The circuit was invented in 1915 by American engineer Ralph Hartley. The distinguishing feature of the Hartley oscillator is that the tuned circuit consists of a single capacitor in parallel with two inductors in series or a single tapped inductor which would be the same thing. And the feedback signal needed for oscillation is taken from the center connection of the two inductors, which is what we see right there on the left. The Culpit oscillator was invented in 1918 by Canadian-American engineer Edwin H. Culpit. It's one of a number of designs that use a combination of inductors and capacitors to produce an oscillation at a certain frequency. You wouldn't want it doing more than one, really. <laughs> the distinguishing feature of the coal pits oscillator is that the feedback for the active device is taken from a voltage divider made of two capacitors in series across an inductor. The coal pits oscillator uses the pair of capacitors to provide voltage division to couple the energy in and out of the tuned circuit. It can be considered the electrical dual of a Hartley oscillator where the feedback signal is taken from an inductive voltage divider. The Pierce oscillator is particularly well suited for use in crystal oscillator circuits. Named for its inventor, George W. Pierce, the derivative of the coal pits oscillator. Yeah, the coal pits got two capacitors over there. The Pierce has a crystal in there. Virtually all digital IC clock oscillators are of the Pierce type, as a circuit can be implemented using a minimum of components. The low manufacturing cost of this circuit and the outstanding frequency stability of the quartz crystal give an advantage over other designs in many applications. That's our three major type of oscillators, more or less up until the digital age. Now we got some more, but... Um, I think that's enough. Yeah. For tonight. That's a start anyway. Yeah, it is. So now that I've explained everything there is to know about oscillators. <laughs> yeah, everything. Roughly. Yeah. A little bit about oscillators. I got a question for you. Okay, hit me. What is a microphonic? A, an IC used for amplifying microphone signals. B, distortion caused by RF pickup on the microphone cable. C, changes in oscillator frequency due to mechanical vibration. Or D, excess loading of the microphone by an oscillator. Microphonic. That's a use for amplifying microphone signals. I don't think that's it. It sounds like some kind of a... Oscillation problem, since how we're talking about oscillators. Distortion caused by RF pickup. I don't think that's it either. Changes in oscillator frequency due to mechanical vibration. Or excess loading of the microphone. I'm going to guess C. What's All everybody right. else saying? I'll agree with you along with everyone else. I think it's C because I don't think it's the other ones. And it is. There you go. Okay, that's probably going to be it for tonight. You had not missed any yet. I'm on fire, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's better than I thought I was going to do. <laughs> microphonic, that's not the only type of microphonic there is in uh, tube-type amplifiers, particularly audio amplifiers. Some of them, you can bump the tube or bump the cabinet, and you'll hear it. You'll hear the tink, tink, tink. Mm-hmm. And that's another type of microphonics, that uh, yeah. tubes can become microphonic with age. Or bad circuit designs, I guess. How is positive feedback supplied in a Hartley oscillator? A, through a tapped coil. B, through a capacitive divider. 
C, through link coupling. Or D, through a neutralizing capacitor. How is positive feedback supplied in a Hartley oscillator? I'll start at the bottom D through a neutralizing capacitor. Now, a neutralizing capacitor is used to, um, to say, neutralize an amplifier or prevent it from oscillating at frequencies you don't want. So that wouldn't be positive feedback. Uh, if there's any kind of feedback, it'd be negative. Um, C, through link coupling. Mm, no, I don't believe so. B, through a capacitive divider. No, I think everyone knows that's a coal pits type of circuit. So yeah. I'm going to say, hey, tap that thing through <laughs> a tapped coal like we saw in the photo earlier. Yeah, yeah like like we saw in the one I still got on my screen here. Okay, you need to hide that photo now. Everybody's saying, hey, I thought you said these were tough tonight. They were until you read that stuff there. Yeah. Because it, it, I it honestly help. had no idea. Yeah, it <laughs> did. I had absolutely no idea whatsoever on any, on any one of these. Yep. That's okay. I'm holding back some more we hadn't explained. Okay. I'm sure. Yep. My only hope is the process of elimination. How is positive feedback supplied in a coal pits oscillator? A, through a tapped coil. B, through link coupling. C, through a capacitive divider. Or D, through a neutralizing capacitor. Well, since we just discussed this, I'm just going to go straight for the answer on this one because we just you actually mentioned it just a minute ago, too, on yeah. your question. So it's got to be C, through a capacitive divider. That's, that's what everybody's saying over in the chat room. I'm inclined to agree. That would be pretty embarrassed if I missed that one, although it's not beyond me. <laughs> I did want to say one thing here, and that's just on that question right there. How is positive feedback supplied in a cold pits oscillator? Positive feedback. Not negative feedback. If you've got positive feedback, you're taking a little of the output, putting it back to the input, it's going to oscillate. Just like if you took a microphone on a PA system and stuck it in front of the speaker, you're going to hear a squeal. That's positive feedback. If it was negative feedback, it would be suppressing the desire to oscillate. But by... Okay. Positive, it keeps adding to the signal and just reamplifying itself till it bursts into uh, oscillation. So oscillators, it's a general rule. All, you know, well, I say all mostly work with positive feedback. It's interesting. I don't think that'll be a question here, but um, well, it's a darn shame it's not. Yep. I think that's how we just covered it. Yep. Marty says, positive feedback, well done. There you go. You know, I've spent enough time where there was positive feedback occurring in the PA system. It's kind of ingrained oh, yeah. in my thought process now, especially when a band sets up and they've got their speakers behind them mm -hmm. to their microphones. That does not really work, although the Grateful Dead got away with it. Yeah, how'd as they a, do that? As a general rule, they used two microphones, identical microphones. One was wired out of phase with the other, uh -huh. so they would cancel. It's like Bob Hyle says, it's all phasing. And you just slide one off from the other a little bit, and and you get them out of phase physically. Hmm. And when you, you talk close yeah. to one of them, it picks up. So, but the other one, it's out of phase, so anything else that's coming around Noise is, is canceled out. Interesting. That's but cool. if you're right on it, you know, uh, that works. Is that true, Marty? I'll ask him because he's a resident audio expert here. 
Uh, at least I believe that's how the Grateful Dead got away with it. Seems like I've seen pictures where they did it that way. It is. It is. Thought so. Cool. How is positive feedback supplied in a Pierce oscillator? <clears throat> Excuse me. A, through a tapped coil. B, through link coupling. C, through a neutralizing capacitor. Or D, through a quartz crystal. Hmm. Well, we've talked about all of this earlier, and we've had all those wrong answers in the other ones. But this is the first one we've had that has a answer of a, through a quartz crystal. And I just happen to know that a Pierce oscillator has a quartz crystal in it, used for positive feedback. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm going with. Yeah. I, I'm just going to say it's D. Yeah, that's what I, I think crystal. you're right, George. Okay. Look there, the chat room says so, too. Pierce oscillator is, well, I want to use the word more stable, maybe, than, a, say, a, a cold pit or a Hartley. More precise. I think I'll say that since it's using a crystal. There's a good lesson here tonight because I've I've come through every one of these without studying just to see mm -hmm. how I do. Every single one of these, all 100 episodes. That's right. This is episode number 100. But if we hadn't have done, went over that, I, I would not have gotten the other ones unless I just got really lucky. You know. I would not have gotten them. And that's a that's a good point. All you need is just a little, sometimes just a little, little bit. A little basic knowledge. Yep. And, and you can reason out most of oh, this. There's a good lesson to be had here. Which of the following oscillator circuits are commonly used in VFOs? A Pierce and Zener? B, Culpitz and Hartley? C, Armstrong and DeForest? Or D, negative feedback and balance feedback? Okay, so I don't remember seeing anything about a Zener one. I don't remember seeing anything about an Armstrong and DeForest. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but I don't. We didn't cover those. I'm gonna and negative feedback and balance feedback. I'm going. I'm going with B. Culpitz and Hartley. Everybody else, everybody else went with B too. Yeah, everybody's going with everybody's B. Everybody's copying off my paper. <laughs> Maybe they're Actually, reading. Actually, might be I'm copying off theirs. <laughs> there you go. Hmm. Cold pits and Hartley. All right, got one for you. Okay. How can an oscillator's microphonic responses be reduced? A. Use NPO capacitors. B, reduce noise on the oscillator's power supply. C, increase the bias voltage. Or D, mechanically isolate the oscillator circuitry from its enclosure. Well, I think you probably know the answer to this one. I think it's D. Uh, yep, that's where I'm going. That's where all the chat room's going. You know, nobody's got any wrong tonight that I've noticed. Yeah. As hard as we thought these questions were yeah. coming in, everybody's got oh, everything. Don't, don't so short because they were. Well, they're going to be they were, they, were in, they were impossible about, what time is it? About uh, 36 minutes ago. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll, they'll change a little bit before we get done with them tonight. So, um, yeah, it's D. Microphonic. Everybody got that. And, you know, a microphone, mechanical. Which of the following components can be used to reduce thermal drift in crystal oscillators? A, NPO capacitors. Ooh. B, toroidal inductors. C, wire wound resistors. Or D, non inductive resistors. Which of the following components can be used to reduce thermal drift in crystal oscillators? I don't know. 
That would be the only crystal oscillator we had would be that Pierce one that we showed. I'm gonna, I'm still going to go with the capacitor A. Okay. Everybody in the chat room is saying A. You know, there's a bunch of smart people in here, or somebody's been studying. Uh-huh. But you didn't study, and you got it right. No, I didn't study, but I just remembered the picture. What do you think NPO is? I have no idea. That was going to be my next question to you. NPO is a negative, positive, zero. So that's NP0, then. NP0. But it, yeah, that's what it is. Zero parts per million divided by the degree centigrade. So an NPO capacitor doesn't, doesn't uh, vary much in value with temperature. Huh. And then the ones I saw, I should have had a picture here. Thermal drift. Okay, well, that makes sense. The ones I saw look pretty much like a common old um, ceramic capacitor. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're NP0 type, so higher quality. Now, you know, some oscillator circuits, and this is not even coming up tonight, but some transmitters will have an oven. The crystal is sitting inside an oven that's temperature yeah, see controlled. Tom talking about that. Oh, wire round wire ra wire wound resistors would work if you use them as a crystal oven, he said. Yeah. But Not so sure what that means. So would a non inductive resistor if you used it as an oven, I would think. But anyway, it's a temperature controlled oven. You put the crystal in there and there's a thermostat that kind of kind of regulates the temperature that the crystal is operating at. A lot of uh, really, yeah, uh, most all AM broadcast transmitters had a circuit like that in them. I'm gonna have to look that up. That's the, interesting. The crystals would have a little heater on them that's thermostatically controlled to hold it at a specific temperature. Huh. Uh, all the early ones had that, and. I have seen uh, what we call Marty transmitters, not the guy with the box of unfulfilled dreams. Dreams, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a Marty brand transmitters that operate. Uh, well, there's two different bands. There's one band around 161, 62 megahertz. Another one around 450 megahertz. That radio stations use to go out and do a remote broadcast and they transmit on those frequencies back to the station, pick it up off the air. So it's more or less like frequencies right above two meters ham radio and right above a 70 centimeter ham radio. Hmm. Um, but usually wider bandwidth, a little higher quality, you know, just, just because it's going to be used for broadcast, but the Marty brand of transmitters, they had modules built in these aluminum cans inside of them, and the oscillator can was stuffed with fiberglass insulation, and that's how they <laughs> they held it on frequency. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's, I, that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I had no idea that such as that existed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up later when I get back home. Yeah. Just to see some examples. Cool. <laughs> All right. I, I wish I'd have got into stuff like that a lot more when I was younger. You can still get into it. Yeah, this is a time. It's not, I, I'm interested in it. I'd like to. But mm -hmm. Just the time is kind of the problem these days. But, yeah. yeah. Maybe when I retire. Okay. Well, that's like... Half our questions tonight. Really? Yeah. Not a buzzer yet. Not a buzzer yet. Hmm. What do you say? I thought we'd we... be changing the batteries in that thing by now. Let's take a quick break, come right back, and see if we can get a little buzzer action going. All right, let's do that.
aim higher, and discover the world of SHF. Explore the world of microwave with ICOM's new SHF portable, the IC905. This all-mode rig covers 144 to 5600 megahertz and with the optional CX10G transferter, 10 gigahertz. This portable also has a few industry first under its belt. The IC905 is the first radio to support the five major bands, VHF to SHF, a power over Ethernet RF module for flexible installation, and is compatible with amateur TV in analog FM mode. Other features include large 4.3-inch color LCD touchscreen, real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, easy digital mode settings, included high-performance GPS antenna, full D-Star functions, including DV and DD mode, and SD memory card slot. For more information about ICOM's amateur offerings, visit icomamerica.com amateur. From May 19th through May 21st, hams can find ICOM at booth 2608 at Dayton Hamvention 2023 in Xenia, Ohio. What do you say we give away something? Well, I, I ran across this. I bet you a lot of people like to have that. How about give this away? That's an official ICOM ham crew two-sided t-shirt. You look, look pretty good at the uh, Dayton Hamvention coming up with this song. You would. This or the Amateur Logic shirt. Sure. But, uh, you look just as good when you leave the ham fest as you do when you get there. Yep. Like I always say. Always yeah. say. You you do always say that. <laughs> and I think um, there'll be some more stuff in that uh, swag package. So Jesse stuffs a box with some other items as well. And we've got a winner every month. And the way these people are winning... They're sending an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. All you got to have is a name and an email address so you can send the email. That's it. That's it. You can put a little note in there with it if you want to as well. We did a random drawing right before the show. I mean right before the show tonight. Literally. To see who this month's winner will be. And we've got a lucky winner here. It is Manly Reynolds. K-E-8-T-N-S. Oh, congratulations. Said, yeah. Enjoy your format and have learned a lot in a pain-free way. That's the best way. I'll say. <laughs> congratulations, Manly. Congratulations. Yep. Yeah. So if you'd like to win, what better time than, well, I don't know, right now. Yeah. Just drop us an email, hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. We'll try to pull your name next month. Yeah, if you didn't win this time or or previously, mm -hmm. send your send your uh, name in. The list gets cleared out every month, so we start over with zero entries in there for the next yeah. drawing. So get we'll, your entries in. We don't harvest or reuse any of the entries. They're just we just empty the trash after each drawing. What type of frequency synthesizer circuit uses a phase accumulator, lookup table, digital to analog converter? And a low-pass anti-alias filter. A, a direct digital synthesizer. B, a hybrid synthesizer. C, a phase-locked loop synthesizer. D, a diode-switching matrix synthesizer. Hmm. Hmm, indeed. Frequency synthesizer. What type of frequency synthesizer circuit uses a phase accumulator, lookup table, digital to analog converter, and a low-pass any alias filter. Well, let's, all those things there don't sound like uh, typical analog components. A diode-switching matrix synthesizer? No. Phase-like loop? No, I don't think they're quite that complicated. A hybrid synthesizer? I don't think so. I think it is A, a direct digital synthesizer, which are real popular right now. So hmm. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say A, a direct digital synthesizer. Interesting. What hmm. would you think? I have no idea. This would have been a buzzer probably for me. 
Well, unless I got to 25% of my luck kicked in. Most of the answers were A. But, uh, and somebody said, who was it? Uh, Jim said the lookup table was the giveaway. And, and yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it's for the same question there. So. Yep. Direct digital synthesizer. It's a method employed by frequency synthesizers used for creating arbitrary waveforms from a single fixed frequency reference clock. DDS is used in applications such as signal generation, local oscillators and communication systems, function generators, mixers, modulators, sound synthesizers, and as part of a digital phase lock loop. A digital phase lock loop, not the regular old analog phase lock loops that we've been using for years. A basic direct digital synthesizer consists of a frequency reference, often a crystal or saw oscillator, a numerically controlled oscillator, that's an NCO, and a digital to analog converter, a DAC. The reference oscillator provides a stable time base for the system and determines the frequency accuracy of the DDS. It provides a clock to the NCO, which produces a discrete time quantized version of the desired output waveform whose period is controlled by the digital word contained in the frequency control register. The sample digital waveform is converted to an analog waveform by the DAC. The output reconstruction filter rejects the spectral replicas produced by the zero order hold inherent in analog conversion process. That's a lot of big words. It is. But that's essentially how it works right there. It's digital kind of magic. Well, we'll see how this comes out. We have a stable oscillator, and then we have a numerically controlled oscillator. We're feeding the signal back and forth between all these, and it's trying to replicate uh, a specific type of signal. may not be a sine wave. It could be almost any kind of waveform you want to generate if you're using a lookup table. That's all I'm going to say about that because there could be some questions now that I think about it related to this. So we'll um, we'll leave that right there. DDS, though, it's very popular in uh, modern amateur radio transceivers. What information is contained in the lookup table of a direct digital synthesizer, a DDS? A, the phase relationship between the reference oscillator and the output waveform. B, amplitude values that represent the desired waveform. C, the phase relationship between the voltage-controlled oscillator and the output waveform. Or D, frequently used receiver and transmitter frequencies. What information is contained in the lookup table of a DTS? Phase relationship, amplitude values. The phase... It's got to be B, the amplitude values that represent the desired waveform. I've made enough lookup tables in my time. Well, then you ought to know. I never made one for a direct digital synthesizer. If I were going to make one, I'd put amplitude values that represent the desired waveform in it. Okay. That's what the folks in the chat room are saying. I'm going to agree with you. Sounds like a good idea to me. Hmm. That was pretty good. That's exactly how I would have done it. And say so you thought these questions were going to be tough it's tonight. It's not over yet. <laughs> we'll see. What are the major spectral impurity components of direct digital synthesizers? A. Broadband noise. B. Digital conversion noise. C. Spurious signals at discrete frequencies. Or D. Nyquist limit noise. What are the major spectral impurity components of a direct digital synthesizer? Of direct digital synthesizers. Okay. A, broadband noise. Now, this is digital, so I don't think that'd be just like... 
Yeah. White noise or broadband noise in there. B, digital conversion noise. That would be my guess. Yeah. But, but remember we had that filter on the output of the direct digital synthesizer. That was, you know, that's sort of like we've talked about uh, A to D and D to A converters before. And, you know, we put uh, the filter on the output of it there. Yeah, I remember that being on there too. Converting digital to analog, and then that filters out. It's basically a low-pass filter. Reconstruction low-pass filter, yeah. if my memory serves me well. Oh, yeah, then your computer. <laughs> uh, I just so happened to pause it yeah. there when we were doing it so I could look at it. D, Nyquist limit noise. No. C, spurious signals at discrete frequencies. And that's going to be it because this is this is direct digital synthesis. So if there was going to be any noise in there, I mean, it's a digital circuit, so there's not going to be broadband noise and all that kind of stuff mm, in there. I would, I would buy that. But there could be, you know, some spurious signals at specific frequencies, so discrete frequencies. I'm going to say C. Chat room's a little mixed on that one. Yeah, it's kind of split down the middle. So yeah. we've got B's, some got C's. You could see that it could be B. You could see that it could be B. <laughs> All right, let's let's see what you did there. That's yeah. clever. Let's. <laughs> this is an accident. Yeah. Pure. Now let's you go ahead and claim it. Let's see. Spurious okay. signals at discrete frequencies. Well, see, that would have been my first buzzer. Now, what were you going to say here? I would I would have thought B. I, I really didn't know, it, I, obviously. It's a good wrong answer, which is why <laughs> they put me. it in there. <laughs> okay. Well, so these are getting a little tougher as we go here. Which of the following must be done to ensure that a crystal oscillator provides... The frequency specified by the crystal manufacturer. A. Provide the crystal with a specified parallel inductance. B. Provide the crystal with a specified parallel capacitance. C. Bias the crystal at a specified voltage. Or D. Bias the crystal at a specified current. Which ones of those do you think are not the right one? I don't know. Oh. I don't think it's C or D. Okay. So I think it's going to be A or B, I think. Provide crystal parallel inductance. I'm going to guess B because capacitance. All those examples in there had capacitors on them, although I know they were simplified circuits. It might not even be the same thing, but I'm going with, I'm going to go with B. Yeah. I'll agree with you. It's a little mix in the chat room on that one. But I don't ever recall seeing inductor across a crystal before. But I do recall seeing capacitors in parallel with the crystal. There you go. Okay. Here, you worked hard for that one. I got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> I need some Tylenol. All right. Ham College brought to you by Tylenol. Nope. All right. Which of the following is a technique for, for providing highly accurate and stable oscillators needed for microwave transmission and reception? A. Use a GPS signal reference. B. Use a rubidium stabilized reference oscillator. That, is that how you say that? Yeah, same thing as squishium. C. Use a temperature-controlled high-Q dielectric resonator. Or D, all these choices are correct. Rubidium, huh? Is that a thing? Yeah, I think it is. Which of the following is a technique for providing highly accurate and stable oscillators <laughs> needed for microwave transmission and reception? You could lock it to a GPS signal for reference since GPS... Signals are highly accurate. I would say that's a 
possibility. Yeah. B, use a rubidium stabilized reference oscillator. And those are, that is a very high quality oscillator. I mean, I think uh, rubidium is, I don't know what I'm talking about, but it just sounds like it's a it sounds, reference standard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard of it before. Uh, C, use a temperature-controlled high-Q dielectric resonator. And I'm familiar with uh, dielectric resonators. I didn't know they had a temperature-controlled high-Q one, but if they did, that sounds pretty good. And since I, I'm, I'm pretty sure A and B are both valid answers, and C likely is, I'm going to say it's D. All of these choices are correct. Okay. Chat room. Uh, they got D. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mostly D in there. So let's see. All these choices are correct. Hmm. That's good. Tell the truth. Are you guys sitting out there with the book open? <laughs> no, they have missed a few. That's true. I I was wondering at the first of the show, though, because nobody was missing anything. Including us, though, yeah. and I thought we would, or I, th- I thought I would. Yeah. We had not had a buzzer yet. Oh, let me take care Let's of that. See, uh, Hold yeah. on. Shouldn't have said it. Why don't you hook us up here? I'll, I'll <laughs> hook you up. What? <laughs> what is a phase-like loop circuit? A- an electronic servo loop consisting of a ratio detector, reactance modulator, and voltage-controlled oscillator. B, an electronic circuit also known as a monostable multivibrator. C, an electronic servo loop consisting of a phase detector, a low-pass filter, a voltage-controlled oscillator, and a stable reference oscillator. Or D, an electronic circuit consisting of a precision push-pull amplifier with a differential input. I'm going to scratch D off because that sounds like a load of bull to me. I'll agree. Electronic servo loop consisting of phase detector, low-pass filter, voltage control oscillator, and a stable reference oscillator. Electronic circuit known as a multivibrator. I don't think that's it either. So I don't think it's B or D. Electronic servo loop consisting of a ratio detector. Reactance modulator. And a voltage controlled oscillator. That seems plausible. A. I'm, so I'm down to A or C. Phase detector. Phase locked loop circuit. Phase locked. I should know this, but I don't. You want a little clue? Sure. All right. You I want to look at this chat room, but I'm not yeah. going to do it. You're saying it's A or C? I think it's A or okay. C. I don't know if it's a fact. Uh, well, but you're saying, okay, you think it is. There's something in one of those that is... Not right. Well, there's more than one thing that's not right, but one thing in particular throws it off for me. What would you use a phase lock loop for? Well, I... would you be using it in a receiver or a transmitter or both? I'm th- uh... I don't know. I would, Transmitter, I think. I, both. I would say oh, both. Okay. Because if you bought an FM stereo well, receiver. C's phase detector in C. I'm think, that's why I'm thinking that might not be it. I'm thinking it might be A. Well, okay. Let me ask you a question. I shouldn't do this. Would you need a reactance modulator and a receiver? I don't know. You're going to modulate in a receiver? Or? Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's what, that's the thing that jumps out at me. Okay, I'll go with C. 
was probably yeah. going to be a buzzer. Maybe Besides the whole no yeah, ratio detector thing, I don't think is right either. The chat room is, um, yeah, they're pretty much saying it's C. Yeah, that's some. Um, so. Yes. Do you find that Tylenol yet? No, I've, I know I've got some around here somewhere, though. But a phase lock loop or PLL is, um, I mean, they've got them in stereo receivers, ham radio transceiver. You know, for an analog circuit, those things were really stable and didn't drift. And so, yeah, it's a pretty popular circuit. I remember and, it being like on advertisements for stuff. Yeah, a the lot past. of stuff. A lot of stuff. A phase lock loop or phase locked loop is a control system that generates an output signal whose phase is related to the phase of an input signal. In its simplest form, a variable frequency oscillator and a phase detector are in a feedback loop. The oscillator's frequency and phase are controlled proportionally by an applied voltage, hence the term voltage controlled oscillator. The oscillator generates a periodic signal of a specific frequency, and the phase detector compares the phase of the signal with the phase of the input periodic signal to adjust the oscillator to keep the phase matched. And I got some more to say about that, but first this. Which of these functions can be performed by a phase-locked loop? A. Eh? Wideband AF and RF power amplification. B. Comparison of two digital input signals or digital pulse counter. C. Photovoltaic conversion optical coupling. Or D. Frequency synthesis or FMD modulation. Oh. I, I mean, I know what the answer is to this one. You got a D. There you go. All the chat room is saying D. We know it's not a wideband AF RF power amplifier. Phase lock loop doesn't amplify a signal. Comp yeah, but you know that. But without going through some of this stuff, a lot of people don't know that. Well, that's what we're going to try to say. That phase lock loop just holds the frequency or the signal in phase. It doesn't amplify it, though. Um Comparison of two digital input signals or digital pulse counter. Phase like loops were came back in the days of analog circuitry. So wouldn't be anything to do with digital. Photovoltaic conversion, optical coupling, I, I think you know. It's not a photo cell mm -hmm. or anything to do with optics. Frequency synthesis and FMD modulation. Yeah, D. Chat room's all saying that. Seems like back in, like, in the 80s and 90s, maybe it had PLL was on uh, yeah, all the advertisement for it radios. It seemed like... Stuff. Clock radios, whatever. Yeah, late 70s, I think, is when I first started noticing that. Um, but, yeah, definitely. Keeping the input and output phase in lockstep implies keeping the input and output frequencies the same. Consequently, in addition to the synchronizing signal, a phase lock loop can track an input signal, or it can generate a frequency that is a multiple of the input frequency. These properties are used for computer clock synchronization, demodulation, and frequency synthesis. So there, we got through them. That was it? That was it. All right, well, I'll see you all next month. I got to get out of here. <laughs> that's, all, that's all you need to know about um, oscillators and whatever else, signal sources, synthesizers, phase lock loop, direct digital synthesizer, stabilizing thermal drift, microphonics, and high accuracy oscillators that you need to know to pass your extra exam. I'm glad we're moving on, but th this is a good. This was a good show. I definitely learned some things on this one <clears throat> that I could not have guessed my way through, or or, or uh, 
worked out through process of elimination and reasoning. Yeah. Not, not without the extra stuff there, yeah. so. A little of this I could have reasoned out and got, but a, particularly the very first stuff, you know, I don't, how well, many those, times do those, you need to know what a Hartley or a Cold Pitts or a Pierce oscillator is? Not every day. Yeah. If you were building a lot of stuff, yeah. You know, if you're building radios, yeah, it's a very specific thing yeah. that you need that information for. Yeah. That and le- and passing your test. But the the old hams, the old generals, and well, maybe even technicians, that would have been important information for them. Yeah, it's not so much today um, with most of the stuff we build. But it, yeah, if you're gonna, you know, build uh, some of the basic type of receivers and transmitters we started with. Mm-hmm. You'd need to know about those oscillators. Pierce, that's, like I say, that's probably an analog oscillator is one of the the more popular types for a long time. The others are used too, but not not quite as stable. Hmm. Wow. These well, get a little indeed. tougher as we go along. I'm scared to know what's going to be on next month. Yeah. Bob says PLL is huge in shortwave listening rigs. Sony 2001. Yes. I mean, you see PLL on just about yeah, you see everything. It on, it, yeah, I remember seeing it on a lot of stuff. Pretty much everything that had the receiver in it. And now you're starting to see DDS on a whole lot of stuff. Hmm. Direct digital synthesis because it's, well... That's the popular thing now. All the cool kids are doing it. You know what they call someone who gets the lowest passing grade on an extra exam? They call him George. No, they they call him an extra. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think I probably yeah. had the lowest passing grade. I didn't study. Why don't you but, get a passing grade? That's all you got to yeah. have, brother. Yep. And you only got to do it once. That's probably a good thing. Although I could, st- I could study it and get it again, I'm sure. But, I, I mean, I'm glad I don't have to do it again. Oh, Chip says he had to bomb up on cat whiskers. <laughs> yeah, you took your test a while back then, Chip. I see Bob. Yeah, extra one. Bob C205, I think that is. Says, what's the logo on my shirt? It's Plymouth, Massachusetts. I got this at Plymouth Rock. Mm-hmm. Mine says W5JDX. I got this at the ham fest, the call sign, when I took my... No, I didn't. Man, I was, I That's was, a vanity call. <laughs> I was right up the road from uh, from Wayne, W1WBL, when I got this shirt. He lives just wow. right up right up from there. Max, actually, I had supper in his town and didn't even know. Mm-hmm. And I wish I'd looked him up. I had to fight a gorilla for this t shirt. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, Tom did all three of his on the same day. Like Jerry Ellsworth. I think she did hers too. It's kind of how I did, Tom. As soon as they dropped the code on the. On the tech, I went and took it the next weekend because it just happened to be they were giving it here. As soon as they dropped the code on the general and extra, went and took it. Well, I studied it. I, I think maybe a month or so before they were giving it again here. I don't remember how long, but, you know. Yeah. First opportunity I had, I, I went and took it. I took the general in Springfield. Yeah. And I immediately started studying for the extra, and then I I came down here and took it. Yeah. Remember, I drove down here. It was snowing. Oh yeah. On the trip down yeah. here. When I... It was a worthwhile trip, though. Oh yeah. Thanks for being here tonight, everyone. Fun times. Always good to to review this stuff and go over it. And... It it is. I was yeah. I was telling Sabrina I was kind of dreading this one because I was I felt like I was probably going to get the buzzer a lot, but. 
I mean, I didn't, but it's, no. it's a miracle. But I always dread dread it because I'm afraid I'm going to like get buzzered a lot and mm -hmm. not embarrass myself because I don't study it. I mean, it's but still, who wants to, who wants to miss a bunch of them? Well, the way you were talking, I thought I should have just plugged in the buzzer. You know, when I saw just, you coming in the driveway yeah, out there, it, just leave it running the whole time. It didn't happen though. So, all right, it's always a good time when you get here and go through it though. Thanks for being here tonight, everyone. Join us. I'm not sure what date. We haven't set the date yet for the next episode of Amateur Logic. It's going to be around the middle of May. But I'm going to be at Hamvention. So it's going to have to be the 19th or the, or the 12th or the 26th then. Yep. Uh, VE3 MIC is going to be at Hamvention. K9 MIT is going to be at Hamvention. All the cool folks. Yeah. Well, most of them. I, probably some others in the chat room here. Oh, uh, yeah. There'll be uh, y'all and about another uh, 20,000 more cool folks running yep. around there. Yep. Fun times. I just hope it doesn't thunderstorm or snow. Well, you subject to have either one of those. Well, you are, yeah. But I'm uh, looking forward to it, and I'll be doing the streaming for Contest University. I mean, I'm not presenting. I'm just doing the video stuff. Uh, and that's, if you've never attended Contest University or watched a live stream of it, and you're not going to Hamvention this year, Check it out on the DX Engineering YouTube channel. It's a lot of good presentations in there. Yeah, Whether you're a contester or not, there's there's information. Yeah, I watched a good bit of it last year. Yeah. Some good stuff. I could tell you who the presenters are going to be on that. Tim Duffy, K3LR, Michael Coulter, WHCI, Ray Novak, N9JA. They'll all be doing the welcome to Contest University 2023. And then Doug Grant, K1DG, Bob Wilson, N6TV, Ward Silver, N0AX, Philip Springer, DK6SP, Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, Joel Harrison, W5ZN, and Rob Sherwood. NC08. So you've heard of a lot of those folks before. Yeah. I met Ward Silver. He actually came to the Jackson Ham Fest he here did. one year. Yeah. We've seen him at some other mm -hmm. Ham Fest around yeah. too. But uh, yeah. So a lot of good presenters there. Should be a good time. I'll be watching virtually. With that, I'm going to find some supper. Okay. Thanks for being here tonight, everyone. And we will catch up with you in the middle of next month for the next time in Trilogic and the end of next month for the next time college. Until then, get out your study guides. Do a little study. If you're not an extra yet and you want to take the exam, it's best to study. It has been passed without study before, but... Not recommended. Not recommended. It's probably been failed a lot more times without study than it True. has been passed. So. 73 everybody 73feeding the signal back and forth between all these and it's trying to rep you try to say that again it's trying to rep you yeah yeah why don't you say it for me i don't know what you're trying to say trying to replicate